I turned over a bright metal shell that rippled when She I... says human longing for mystery leads to a commonality of belief in immortality. Dad's late or I'm early. Either way, I have time to scout the pens. Kim... Redemption and claustrophobia, what artists understand. Not valuing the... My father worked in a factory all his life, and there was a very strong feeling in the in the in the house and in the family that you know the way to get on was to do well in university, do well in school, get a university, and from there it just continued into academics. It was very fortuitous that I came to the United States. However, I really don't think I would have done nearly as well had I stayed in England, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, I'm not sure I can even. Uh, elucidate them, but I, it's, uh, it was a less constrictive environment than England. The British class, the British uh, academic system seemed, and still seems pretty, pretty staid to me. Well, this is the region I, I specialize in. As a geographer, I'm a Great Plains specialist, historical geography, Native Americans. So my writing's largely been about the Great Plains and Nebraska. Uh, it's influenced it considerably then in, in, in content and in historical imagination. It's mostly fine writers who, who have been influential. Within my field of geography, there is uh, Donald Meinig, who is the, the most important uh, 20th century, late 20th century geographer. Another geographer called Ifu Tuan. Uh, these, these are uh, inspirations in terms of my geography writing, but most of the people, most of the authors who in, in, you know, inspire me, uh, I certainly don't try to emulate them, but they inspire me by their, by their greatness are Cormac McCarthy, the uh, American writer, uh, Ian McEwan, uh, an English writer, James Welsh, the Blackfeet writer, and, uh, and Anton Chekhov the Russian physician and playwright. Well, I'm particularly interested in uh, Native American dispossession, the process by which they lost their lands, and the federal policies that produced that. I'm very interested also in the claims process now, whereby Native Americans, and in recent decades, whereby Native Americans have had opportunities of sorts to go to court and to revisit the dispossession process that took place in the 19th century. I'm interested in writing something that's got to do with social justice. I'm not interested in doing research that is not uh, in some way connected to social justice. And Native Americans, obviously, is a theme that, uh, that is relevant to that. And there's also a theme that lends itself to geography, because it's got to do with land. A great deal of it's got to do with land, attitudes towards land, disputes over land, and the acquisition of land, which made the great settlement of the Great Plains, or should I say the resettlement of the Great Plains, possible. Uh, so the, this is a major theme. I'm interested in the settlement of the Great Plains by Euro-Americans, but I'm particularly interested in the impact that had on the indigenous peoples. Uh, I think it's very important to keep uh, keep the history of Native Americans alive, because I think there's a great desire to swallow it up and forget it. And what that, le what that leads to is the perpetration of further injustices in the present and in the future. If that history is not clear in people's heads, it turns into myth very easily. I think especially dealing with Native Americans. Uh, Dances with Wolves is a good example of history as myth, but for lots of people, Perhaps that's regarded as history. Very entertaining movie, but nothing to do with history. So uh, I keep keeping the history alive and making sure that, uh, that people, Plains people, realize that Native Americans are not a thing of the past. I think what is important is to think what you want to say, 
and to say it as plainly as you can. Leave the really fancy stuff for the very good writers who can deal with all kinds of metaphors and images. I think just being able to express, to think clearly and express your ideas clearly is a very important thing. And, and, and plainly even. And the second thing is to work at it like you'd work at anything else, to put a shift in and uh, to chip away at it because it eventually gets done. Even a sentence a day, something gets done. Uh, I'd like to compare how New Zealand has dealt with the Maori to the way the United States has dealt with Native Americans. And I've started this. I've written some stuff on this and spent some time in New Zealand. And uh, I'd like to look at the whole history of dispossession uh, as a contrast, a comparison between the two countries, and then look at the claims process which is going on now. And I already know that New Zealand has done a much better job of it. So I want to develop that comparative history. And the second thing I want to do is write some popular stories, f factual stories, not fiction, uh, about uh, episodes on in, in 19th century Nebraska involving Native Americans and Americans. There's some really fascinating stories out there just, just waiting to be told. David Wishart is a professor of geography at UNL and an editor of the Encyclopedia of the Great Plains. The book contains 26 interpretive essays on Plains life and 1,400 additional subject entries by scholars throughout the world. The production of this book has been supported through grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Nebraska Foundation, in the Nebraska Humanities Council. Professor Wishart was born in Durham, England. He received his BA at Sheffield, England, and his MA, as well as his PhD from UNL. Honors he has been awarded include the Woodrow Wilson Dissertation Fellowship, the University of Nebraska Distinguished Teaching Award, in the J.B. Jackson Prize for Academic Writing that is accessible for a general audience. His book, An Unspeakable Sadness, The Dispossession of the Nebraska Indians, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He was a visiting lecturer from 1986 to 1987 in China and in 1996 in New Zealand. I am pleased to present Professor, Professor Wishart in the Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors this evening. Please welcome him. What I want to do is introduce this project I've been working on, the Encyclopedia of the Great Plains, and also talk about the Great Plains region, this area it uh, intends to portray. I want to go into the project first, it's, uh, it, how it got going, where it's at, how it's organized, and then go into the Great Plains region, uh, uh, and finally, I can give you in a dozen slides or, some, uh, or thereabouts a, a glimpse at some of the, the uh, material that's going to be covered in this encyclopedia. Uh, as far as Genesis goes, this encyclopedia was conceived in 1990 at the Center for Great Plains Studies. It was uh, conceived as a region-defining work, is how we saw this, 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 this book. It really got moving in 1995 when we got the grant, a substantial grant from the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities. A grant was renewed in 1999 and should see us through. In addition, as was already mentioned in the introduction, the Nebraska Humanities Council, uh, the Great Plains uh, Center, the University of Nebraska, the Foundation, uh, they've all helped with smaller but valuable grants to keep us going. We should be finished uh, I think, by the year 2002, in the summer. And I'm not sure whether it's going to be a celebration or I'm going to go into postpartum depression at that stage because it will have been seven years uh, in a long project. I think had I known it was going to be that long, I never would have got involved. Uh, its status, we're about three quarters finished. Uh, as of this morning, 850 entries, signed, sealed, and delivered. Uh, 23 of the 26 interpretive essays are finished, and the other three, I'm told, are on the way. 
Uh, that may not seem like uh, three quarters of the way through. After all, we're talking 1,400 entries here. But it took so long to get going on the project, to get the conception right, to figure out what we were doing. And once we got going, we got a momentum going, and I, I think we are about three quarters, three quarters finished. Um, the uh, entries and essays are scholarly, but they're aimed at a broad audience. That's the purpose. We want to make this accessible to residents of the Great Plains. And the price is aimed at a broad audience, too. We're aiming on publishing this. University of Nebraska Press is going to publish it at less than $40, just under $40. Uh, I might add, we need a $38,000 subvention <laughs> in order to do that. And we're, we're hoping that some big plains industry, which also has an entry in the encyclopedia, perhaps, will be very happy to have a whole page put across at the beginning, which says, you know, Due to our kindness, this book is accessible to Plains residents at less than $40, but so far that hasn't happened. Uh, it'll be a 1,600-page single volume uh, when, it, when it comes out. And, oh, and I might add this, that any royalties we derive will go towards putting books in libraries and schools throughout the Plains, so we're not going to get rich from it. Oh, there's talk of spin-offs on paperbacks of individual chapters as a CD-ROM but I just signed on for the single 1,600-page volume. All right, it's organization. Uh, it's organized thematically into 26 chapters, each introduced by a six, 7,000-word essay, then followed by f an average of about 50 alphabetically organized entries. So we're trying to do a combination of thematic interpretation and, and factual presentation. Um, it would have been much easier to do a straight alphabetical encyclopedia. The very fine encyclopedia in New York City is such, and it works really well. But this way, we thought we could present a synthesis, not just in a, a pre presentation of, of factual information, but a synthesis. Uh, and so we we have, uh, I'm pleased we went with this organization. Uh, we'll need to do a very good job of cross-referencing because of this. Uh, for example, uh, where are you going to put Crazy Horse? In the chapter on war? In the chapter on Native Americans? Well, if you go to Native Americans and Crazy Horses in war, it'll have to be shown you know, cra in, in the Native American chapter, Crazy Horse, see, you know, see war. Similarly with somebody like Gordon Parks, the Renaissance man, does he go in African Americans, does he go in literary traditions, does he go in film? We have to make uh, choices based on the individual and their overall impact, I think, uh, on, su on, on, on such uh, placements in this encyclopedia. That's the kind of conceptual problems this has, organization has, has presented to us. Um, We'll also have a comprehensive index, but we're going to go out of our way to make sure people can find the entries, because it's harder to find an entry in an encyclopedia organized this way. And it's been a real learning process, of course. We've made mistakes, uh, and we like to say that by the time we're finished, we'll really know how to do one of these. Um, and of course, we'll know a lot about the region. And if we don't know a lot, we'll know where to go and find out about it. So that's, that's, that's the project and where it stands just now. You can see the way it's organized. Uh, land, peoples, economy and polity, society and culture. Um, when we came up with this idea, we applied to NEH, they turned us down. They said it was a good project, they turned us down. We went back to them, they said it was a good idea, they turned us down. We went back to them and they said, look, you've got to define the region first. Where's the Great Plains? And it seemed a little backwards because it's a region defined and work when it's finished. But nevertheless, as a geographer, I thought this was a worthy thing to take on. And so when we were successful in getting the grant, it's because we defined the region and spoke about the Great Plains region and justified it as a place worthy of an encyclopedia. And uh, when I wrote up this, uh, 
it occurred to me that regionalism and regionalization are two very different things. It's a dilemma that a geographer like myself faces all the time when identifying places that are particular, have a distinctive character. Regions clearly exist. I think we, we know that. There are parts of the earth that are, distinctly, are distinctive from other parts of the earth, significantly distinctive. People who inhabit them have a sense of regionalism. They have a sense of identity, and they feel an identification with the region. That's regionalism. But regionalization is something quite different. Um, try putting sharp boundaries. Try regionalizing a place and putting sharp boundaries around a region and saying, well, this is the Great Plains region, this is the south. There's the Midwest, there's Northeast England. These are regions that certainly exist, but try to put a boundary around them. This uh, was from a paper done by Sonia Rossum, who's actually the uh, coordinator and manager of our project, where she mapped uh, 50 different definitions of the Great Plains region and put the boundaries around them as they were shown, you know, from physical criteria to human criteria and so forth. You can see a certain nesting of the boundaries here, but you can also see a tremendous overlap in this region of ours that extends from Canada to the Rio Grande, essentially. So to come up with one boundary was, was quite different. Uh, I could have done what the in editors of the Encyclopedia of Southern Culture did, which is another very successful encyclopedia, and which follows a thematic organization like ours. And they said, quite simply, that the South is wherever Southerners are. And it didn't seem to work quite as well for the Great Plains, you know, the Great Plains is wherever Plains people are. I, it didn't seem to carry the same weight somehow. So what I tried to do then was to identify the region using, uh, using particular criteria to identify it and come up with a boundary that would be the boundary of our encyclopedia. Um, let me see here. Let me go back to the organization here. And the the criteria, some of the criteria that I came up with were these. And I think these are worth talking about to people who are interested in the Great Plains. Start with the physical environment, climatic variability. Uh, rainfall in the Great Plains uh, uh, goes down from 30, an average of 30 inches and they used to about 15 inches less than the lee of the Rocky Mountains in Canada and in Colorado. The region can expect droughts of 35 days annually. 60 to 70 days every 10 years, and of disastrous proportions less frequently. 1930s, and particularly the 1890s, which was even a worse drought for the plains than the 1930s. Remains to be seen what category the current drought was going to fall into. Um, what this means is, is that it's the variable climate that makes the, the plains particular. To the east, you've got a more guaranteed rainfall. To the west, you've got a more guaranteed aridity. In the Great Plains, some years are one, some years are the next. It is this uncertainty that makes the Great Plains its climate so difficult. It's made it so difficult to settlers. And there's other hazards, of course, too. You know them. Continentality. 170 degrees range in Jordan, Montana, between the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum temperature recorded. It's the greatest continentality experience in the world, except for some inner part of Siberia. Uh, blizzards, tornadoes, hail. Hail's the biggest uh, destroyer of crops on, in, in eastern Colorado, for example. Not drought. Uh, floods, of course. All pose challenges to residents. So here's one criterion that I used in defining this region. The second one, physical one also, is what settlers always said. The place has got a lack of timber except the riparian woodlands along the rivers, of course. Uh, they always refer to the area as treeless in a derogatory sense. Uh, it struck me driving through Pennsylvania this, this uh, winter that Pennsylvania is obviously grassless, but it didn't seem to carry the same kind of weight as treeless. <laughs> uh, but again, compared to the regions to the east or the west, this lack of timber really posed problems to settlers and to the original inhabitants. Pawnees moved their villages every few years, largely because the local timber gave out. And you either moved the village or you had to haul the timber a long way. The, the settlers' adjustments, you know, the sod house, the fencing materials, the, the fuel you know of. The lumber yard. Lumber yard, along with the grain elevators, the first industry to go into any plains town. Because you needed wood, you needed sawed boards brought down from Minnesota generally. So the lumber yard goes in. Drawn, you know, is, is 
this need for timber, the difficulty of getting timber. It hadn't been there further east. It wasn't there in the Rocky Mountains. That's another defining criterion, and there's many human responses to it. Still on the physical aspects, just sheer distance. Sheer distance, the problem of conquering distance across the plains. The Missouri River is the only was the only navigable river, and even that was difficult. The first steamboat, the Yellowstone, goes up to uh, Montana, Fort Union, in 1832. The steamboats constantly are getting stuck on the river. Um, so unlike further east, there wasn't that access of, uh, of uh, water transportation into the region. Now, the railroads conquered the distance for European Americans, just as the horse had done so, really, for Native Americans. And then the automobile filled in the interstices. It's no coincidence that in the 1920s, Kansas and Nebraska ranked respectively third and fourth in the ratio of cars to people in the United States. You had to have an automobile. You had to be able to get to town. Um, this space distance is still a problem. In fact, it's in many ways, it's an exacerbated problem as bus services are, are canceled out and air, air services decline. Uh, the costs of space, of keeping a school up, uh, consolidating schools and students having to board in town, getting access to doctors in these sparsely populated areas. It's a defining characteristic of the plains as a region. Now, I should say, however, that many residents regard this space not as a problem to be endured, but as a quality to be celebrated. The idea of the, the quality of room to breathe and the claustrophobic feeling that Plains residents often get when they go elsewhere. Now, set against these difficulties is this ambivalence, the fecundity, the great fertility of the Great Plains. So there are physical problems, but it's worth it for what it has to offer. The bison herds on that, the grazing potential of the region for the bison herds, and then for the cattle driven north after 1865 up to the northern plains, central and northern plains from Texas. And then that soil, that dark soil, uh, which has made this region, in image and reality, the breadbasket of North America. It's captured really well in uh, Rolvag's book on the settlement uh, in South Dakota, Norwegian settlement in South Dakota, Giants in the Earth. Uh, the, this ambivalence is captured. Per Hanser, the protagonist, you know, he holds this black soil up and runs it through his fingers like gold. It's the promised land for somebody who's been used to scratching a living out of a Norwegian stony soil. Meanwhile, his wife, Barrette, goes quietly crazy in her sod house, with nothing to hide behind, and just distance and loneliness around her. So there's an ambivalence here. The difficulties of the environment, the fecundity. But then I need to go back to the railroad. There's probably no region whose character and geography has been so influenced by the railroad as the Great Plains. Um, railroad's important to European American settlement everywhere in North America. But unlike further east, railroads generally preceded settlers into the plains. They generally, the settlers either came in with them or they came in behind them, recruited by them. So the railroads laid down the settlement patterns. They laid down the linear lines. They made the connections to Kansas City, to Chicago, to Minneapolis, into the region, or to Winnipeg, in the case of the Canadian, um, the Canadian railroads. The railroad allowed commercial farming. You couldn't have commercial farming in Nebraska more than five miles or 10 miles from the Missouri River until the railroads came in and allowed goods to be got in and grain to be got out. The railroads colonized vast areas with the land grants and propaganda. They seduced settlers into areas where settlers should never have gone, like eastern Montana, and they failed and were embittered by it. Um, the railroads determined the spacing and the morphology of the towns. They, decided, they determined which towns made it, which didn't. And here on the plains, you got the T-town, morphology. The railroad going through the town, bisected by the main street, the grain elevator, the lumber yard on one side of the railroad, the main town on the other side. A distinctive railroad plan of a town, unlike the courthouse squares that were further east. And in some cases, in the eastern plains that were there before the railroads. And of course, the railroads killed off 
expecting towns that didn't get them. Um, so the railroad is vitally important. Another factor about the planes, it was settled late. It was settled late. A good deal of the planes, well, I should say for European Americans, it was settled late. Uh, a good deal of the planes were settled on 20th century frontiers. Uh, Western North Dakota, much of eastern Montana, Panhandle of Texas, Panhandle of Oklahoma. These are 20th century frontiers. It's very recent. Because it was settled late, it was settled fast, because the railroads took them in. Incidentally, it meant that there were far too many towns and everything put down. Uh, population population the peaks for many uh, Plains areas are 1890, 1900. It's been down since for many areas. Uh, but what this lateness of settlement also meant is that it, the Plains were settled at a time when there was a great diversity in source regions for American immigrants. Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, Asia, Latin America. So the Plains were settled with a great diversity of settlement because of the timing of the settlement. And that ethnic patchwork persists particularly in the Prairie Provinces, north of 49th parallel, where there's a mosaic rather than a melting pot. There hasn't been the pressure to disappear into a sort of Americanization in Canada that there has here. But this great, di this great diversity of ethnicity, which continues. Of course, look at Lincoln's landscape. A place like Garden City. Garden City is 4% Kansas, 4% Asian, 28% Hispanic. The, di the diversification continues. And then this brings us to a very important one, and that's the Native American presence, historical and contemporary. Uh, no other part of the of no other region, possible exception of the southwestern United States, continues to have the stamp of Native Americans as emphatically as does the Great Plains, particularly the northern Great Plains and, of course, Oklahoma, which was Indian territory, where Native Americans were moved in order to allow resettlement to take place removed from all over the country. Native Americans have been on the plains for at least 18,000 years. And that's when the northern plains were covered by glaciers. Native Americans were here in Nebraska. And Native American population now is growing much faster than the non-Native American population on the plains, certainly than the Euro-American Euro population on the plains. So despite the persecution, the diseases, the uprooting, the prevailing racism. Uh, Native Americans are Plains people who are going to continue to define the region. And there's many other things we could talk about, and I did in order to try to persuade them to give us this grant. It's been a region of great protest. We have a chapter called Protest and Dissent. Not every region deserves a chapter like that. I mean, we got Carrie Nation, you know. Uh, busting up saloons in Kiowa, Kansas in 1900, two wounded knees, 1890, 1973, all kinds of political protests, the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919, one of the largest strikes ever in North America. And so it's a region of protest, often against outside forces. It's a region of imposed images, often unfavorable images. The Great American Desert of Stephen Long, the Buffalo Commons more recently, Images often imposed from the outside. So uh, we have a chapter called Icons and Images, which talks about these, the, these uh, images, and so forth. And on and on, there's many more criteria that can be used to define the region. So this is how the argument was put together. And this is the region that we came up with. Uh, this is the spatial context of the encyclopedia. And I must admit, I used a very postmodern definition because the criteria I used to define this, these boundaries changed uh, from, part of, from place to place. The western boundary is the least ambiguous, and it's defined mainly by physical geography. It's defined by the mountains. You know, you go west from Calgary, you know where the plains end. You go west from Denver, you know where the plains end. It's complicated in some parts. In New Mexico, for example, what is physically the Great Plains, it's a volcanic area in eastern New Mexico there, is literally as high as the Rocky Mountains, which is adjacent to it. So that gets complicated on the ground. The Wyoming Basin's complicated because the plains extend into Wyoming quite a way. And then you've got outliers of the Rocky Mountains like the Black Hills, which geologically are part of the Rocky Mountains, but they lie within the Great Plains. 
and we include them in our region. Incidentally, by drawing the western boundary like this, we also include in the two largest cities in our region, Denver and Calgary, both become plain cities. Uh, legitimately so, I think, too. The northern boundary is also largely physically defined biogeographically. We define the boundary here at the line between the parkland belt of mixed woodland and grassland in Canada and the boreal forest, the pine forest, to the north of it. The parkland belt, since Native Americans uh, originally were here, has be always been united with the plains proper to the south, down towards the, the international border. So here was a physical boundary largely too, but it became a human boundary because that parkland belt was the area that was settled largely through the Canadian Pacific Railroad and where the density of population is greatest. Incidentally, the 49th parallel, that arbitrary line, straight line, you always tell when it's a European-American line, it's a straight line, boundary, drawn through the middle of what was unknown territory in 1818 when they, when they drew it. We have... We, we, we crossed that boundary to include the Canadian prairies, and that's been our biggest challenge because we don't know much about Canada. Let's admit it. I know I'm getting to know a lot more. Getting a balance between the Canadian part of our region and the U.S. part of our region has been, has been a challenge. It's also perhaps the greatest strength of the encyclopedia, the fact that we've gone over that boundary and we are international. Um, so we didn't truncate our region at the international boundary, quite arbitrary, I might add, too, it would have been. The southern boundary is also physically defined. If you've traveled down there, you go over the edge of the Edwards Plateau in Texas, over the Balcones Escarpment, it's called, and you descend down to the, cent the coastal plain with Austin, San Antonio, lying underneath the escarpment. Geologically, it's part of the Great Plains. Uh, when you travel through it, as far as landscape goes, it's part of the Great Plains. It was settled later than the coastal plain was. So that's a physical boundary, too. That leaves us with this, this ambiguous eastern boundary, which really, is, as you know, is a transition zone more than a boundary. And what this has led scholars to do in the past is, 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 is draw an arbitrary line. I've got the 98th meridian on there. Essentially goes through Grand Island, north and south there. Uh, Walter Prescott Webb, in his famous book on the Great Plains, he talked about the 98th meridi meridian as being the boundary of the Great Plains. It's been used again and again. Well, I don't like using straight lines, ha which have no geographical basis whatsoever. Moreover, I couldn't adopt that line because Lincoln would be, therefore, outside the Great Plains with its Center for Great Plains Studies, which just would not have done at all. <laughs> uh, and so I drew an eastern boundary based on cultural, political, historical criteria, drew it down through Winnipeg. Winnipeg's a city that looks to the prairies, whereas uh, eastern Manitoba looks eastward towards Ontario. I drew it down the boundaries of the Dakotas, Nebraska and Kansas. These states were settled later than the areas to the east, particularly Iowa and Missouri, with the resultant differences in terms of importance of railroads and so forth. Uh, that's also an, a, a voting boundary, boundary between essentially democratic voting to the east, Republican voting to the west. If you put it together year after year after year, you see this is a cultural divide. I didn't want to break up the integrity of these states either, really. But of course, the boundary has to be transgressed. That North Dakota boundary there, it really draws a line right through the Red, through the Red River Valley, which makes no geographical sense. The Red River Valley, until 9,000 years ago, was glacial Lake Agassiz. It's as flat as a pancake, one of the flattest parts of the entire Great Plain. And so there are entries in the encyclopedia on floods in the Red River Valley, on the Bonanza farming of the Red River Valley, which was the first large-scale farming on the Great Plain in the 1870s. So the boundary gets transgressed there a little bit. I've transgressed the boundary to Kansas City, Missouri, too. Kansas City, Missouri organized the settlement of the Great Plains. The stockyards were in Kansas City, Kansas. The capitalists were in Kansas City, Missouri. Moreover, and this is where idiosyncratic things come into play, I wanted Kansas City jazz in the encyclopedia. Charlie Parker was born in Kansas City, Kansas, but it was Kansas City, Missouri where he played his stuff. I wanted Robert Altman in the encyclopedia. Robert Altman's from Kansas City. 
Missouri. So there's got to be some advantages to being an editor. You've got to be able to take some liberties <laughs> with hard and fast regions. And these boundaries are going to be transgressed to a degree. But really what, what we have here is, you know, is a spatial context, a receptacle that we're seeking to fill with people and events and characteristics to add up to what makes this place distinctive. Oh, I, I should also add here that I drew the boundary right between Dallas and Fort Worth. I, I, uh, in, I, I withdrew the boundary in in eastern Oklahoma and uh, from eastern uh, Texas because that was part of the Deep South. That was cotton country. Dallas was always a cotton town. It looked east of the Black Prairies. Fort Worth was always a cattle town. It looked west. So the boundary goes right down through the airport there between the two cities, essentially. So this is the bounded region, as I say, a receptacle that we hope to fill. Uh, put another way, uh, I was just reading a review by Larry McMurtry in a recent article in the New York, New, York, New York Review of Books. And McMurtry says this, he says about the Great Plains. He says, the Great Plains themselves feel at times like an almost forgotten region, yet there are wonders in it. But what we're trying to identify are these wonders of people and places and events, but the mundaneness too, the rhythms of everyday life that go on in the region and have gone on in the region. So that's the region. Let's, uh, in this encyclopedia, there are going to be about 200 black and white illustrations and a 16-page center part of color, which will largely be taken up with artworks, really because they need to be done in color. But what I've got here is just a, a, a dozen or so glimpses. Some of the slides we've got in already as we've collected them. And they're roughly in chronological order, and they're not necessarily representative. Uh, Deadwood, 1880, during the gold rush. Uh, you can see what kind of place it is. Um, a place with, in addition to what you can see here, the kinds of services you've got here, the liquor dealer looking quite prominent there, uh, a Chinese area at the bottom of the street with opium dens, uh, the Chinese being brought in for the manual labor in the mines. And apparently Deadwood was filled with lawyers because there was a constant litigation going on. So there's a, a view of Deadwood. That's from the Cities and Towns chapter in the encyclopedia. Fanny Overstreet, plowing up the North Dakota prairie about uh, probably in the 1890s from the gender chapter. Uh, from an entry on women homesteaders. Uh, women who were single or widowed or divorced could take out a homestead. Women who were married couldn't. But there were a good number of individual women homesteaders on the plains. We've got a good entry on them. Pound maker. We've got a very strong uh, chapter in representation of Native Americans in this encyclopedia, throughout the encyclopedia. You know, chapter on architecture has got earth lodges in it, for example. A pound maker was the chief of the Plains Cree in what is now central Saskatchewan. He's a great critic of the Canadian government's uh, federal policy towards the Indians, and he got caught up in the Northwest Rebellion in 1885. And he was put in jail in Manitoba in the penitentiary. He got let out after a couple of years, and he died shortly of uh, tuberculosis. These are in the Native Peoples chapter, and of course, many others, you know, from Sitting Bull to Red Cloud to Wilma Mankiller are in the Native American chapter. From the Politics and Government chapter, delineating the 49th parallel, the uh, boundary was defined on maps in 1818, but it wasn't demarcated on the ground until the 1870s. And what they did here was they put mounds every three miles, about six feet high, these mounds, which are essentially surveying points, right across this, what is the largest single land boundary in the world, across the 49th parallel. Of course, it's a boundary that is increasingly uh, uh, permeable because of NAFTA. Well, it was always permeable. It was the medicine line. Indians always went on the other side of it to escape the authorities. Uh, and settlement went back and forward across it too, Euro-American settlement. And now with NAFTA, trucks are going back and forward across it more and more. That's in the po politics and government uh, chapter. Uh, Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow in the law chapter. Good placement, I think. 
Uh, Bonnie Parker's from the Plains, from we Rowena, Texas. Uh, Clyde Barrow was just from the wrong side of the boundary. I suppose we could say that. South of Dallas. And they murdered up and down the eastern plains and as far in to the plains as eastern New Mexico between 1832 and 1834. And they, stu they stole a car in, uh, in Mead, Kansas, took off for Louisiana, and they were shot in that car. L literally riddled in bullets in that car. We got a really nice entry on Bonnie and Clyde. From the industry chapter, a, a uh, order form from Big Daddy Joe Justin, put out in the 1870s and 1880s. Form you could send, you could, you know, you'd send out to you and you'd measure your feet and they'd send you a pair of Justin boots. And soon every cowboy in the range had a pair of Justin boots on. Uh, this is from Nacoma, Nacona, Texas, in the industry chapter. I've got a couple others here from the industry chapter. The Fritchell Electric Car. Uh, you know, before the big companies took over, there were quite a few independent small car companies on the plains. The Fritchell electric car was put out in Denver. Denver was quite a center. And here it's shown on a publicity trip from Lincoln to Washington, D.C. Obviously, couldn't go across the plains. The, pl the roads were too bad on the plains. It started off in Lincoln, not Denver. Uh, I don't know whether it made it, actually. Um, and here's one of my favorites. The original car heater, engine car heater, which was invented by Andrew Freeman, an electrical engineer in a Grand Forks basement in 1947. Uh, he tried a number of ways to get the cars to start up there. Uh, and he eventually came up with this, this brass uh, rod, essentially, which fitted in through one of the head bolts that was taken out of the engine, and it heated the engine directly. And the head bolt heater went on to sell two million, two million items. It was a big success. It was eventually taken over by more successful, uh, by a more modern head bolt heaters. But I understand that, that even the more modern ones are sometimes still called head bolt heaters. I actually was sent one of these by Freeman's son. I'm now a possessor of a head bolt heater. Uh, and the, the Plains has been the, 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 the locus for many inventions. The parking meter came out of came out of uh, Stillwater, two Oklahoma State professors put the parking meter together. And a number of other inventions come out of this area of ours. From the agriculture chapter, uh, in the, the cattle guard, independently developed throughout the plains from Texas all the way north to the Prairie Provinces after about 1905. Once automobiles came in, you had to have something like this. It, was, it came in with the automobiles. And it uh, is generally regarded as a cattle guard south from here, as an auto gate north from here, and interestingly enough, as a Texas gate in the prairie provinces. But it's the same phenomenon wherever you are. Sturgis, Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, South Dakota, from the Sports and Recreation chapter. Uh, first full week of August, this is the, the main street of Sturgis. It started with Pappy Hole in 1938. He ran the local motorbike shop. That year, there were 80 people attended the Sturgis motor Motorcycle Rally. 50 years later, 400,000 attended. And as I say, this is in our sports and recreation chapter. And finally, out of a huge list, and I'll mention some of them of actors, Philem happens to be my favorite chapter in this book, I have to say, this is Cleveland. Jake Little, stage, screen, and TV actor from Chickasaw, Oklahoma, and perhaps best known as mild-mannered Sheriff Bart in Brazen Saddles. He's one of our actors in this encyclopedia. But just think of all the others. I mean, I, I think you probably know the Nebraska ones to a great extent. You know Fred Astaire and Harold Lloyd and Marlon Brando and Montgomery Clift and Sandy Denny and Colleen Gray and so forth. It's incredible number of famous actors actresses have come out of this region. But it seems to be the same elsewhere, too. Uh, as far as African-American actors go, uh, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten his name. Johnson, somebody Johnson. Uh, Colorado Springs in the 1890s. Noble Johnson, Colorado Springs in the 1890s, the first African-American to make it big in Hollywood. 
using the same class as Lon Chaney, Hunchback of Notre Dame in Colorado Springs. Same street in Helena, Montana, just on the fringe of the plains, granted, and you have Myrna Law and Gary Cooper growing up within just a few houses of each other. Drop down to Kansas, Fatty Arbuckle, Hollywood's biggest star until accused of murdering a woman in the, uh, in the, in the, in the teens and early 20s, the biggest star, Smith Center, Kansas, the menacing Dennis Hopper, Dodge City, Kansas, Louise Brooks, Cherryvale, Kansas, and the greatest of them all, Buster Keaton, Piqua, Kansas. A lot of these people didn't stay for long. Their parents were vaudeville people, like Keaton's, and they got uprooted and out of here fast. But they're Plains people, as far as our encyclopedia is concerned, particularly if you're Buster Keaton, you are. And they're all in the encyclopedia of the Great Plains. So thank you, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. <laughs>